Technology is showing up in some of the most interesting places. It's not just for engineers and scientists. It's in all of our lives, at work, at home, and at play. Welcome to the journey inside the computer. Intel Corporation is committed to improving technology education in schools across the country. And we hope that you'll find these materials helpful in introducing your students to the subject. Technology is all around us. Even the tape player and the monitor you're using right now probably contain a number of microprocessors. And these chips are becoming more powerful, more complex, and more prevalent every day. As students learn how computers and microprocessors work, a world of possibilities opens to them. First, they'll become more effective users of technology. Even more importantly, they'll realize that computers are going to play a crucial role in whatever career they choose. Some may even become aware of new career opportunities or see new technological possibilities. This kit contains everything you need to take your students on a journey, a journey inside the computer and then outward to explore computer networks and the impact that technology is having on society. It doesn't matter what kind of computer your students use. The materials aren't specific to any particular computer system. The lessons will introduce them to basic concepts, concepts that are common to all computers. None of the activities require computers, so even if your students don't have access to a computer, they can learn a lot about how the technology works. In this video, I'll walk you through the different parts in the kit and show you what it contains and how it's organized. After I've previewed the contents of each unit, Dr. Irene Smith of the International Society for Technology and Education will join me. Dr. Smith was one of the primary developers of the kit. She's conducted in-service workshops on its use throughout North America. Together, Dr. Smith and I will suggest ways that you can adapt these materials to your own classroom. It's important that you use the kit in ways that are comfortable to you and that complement your existing curriculum and teaching style. We've designed the materials so that they can be used by teachers with a wide range of technical backgrounds. If you're just looking for a few activities to supplement the things you're already doing in the classroom, you'll find a number of possibilities in the kit. You'll also find plenty of activities for two to three class periods. Even if you want a complete, in-depth technology curriculum, you'll find what you need in the kit. Let's take a moment to see what the kit contains. You've obviously already found the teacher's video, but you'll also find a teacher's guide, a binder with shrink-wrap pages and overhead transparencies, a chip kit with the materials you need to do some of the activities with your class, the student video, which introduces the content of each unit, and a colorful poster. The teacher's guide begins with a table of contents. The preface outlines the organization of the kit, lists icons for each segment, and makes suggestions for the use of transparencies. It also provides a brief overview of the history of computing and explains the kit's instructional approach. The guide includes detailed instructions for each of the eight units. Though each individual unit covers a different topic, they're all organized in the same way. Each includes background information for teachers, video-based lessons, and extension lessons. Let's look at Unit 1, for example. The unit begins with background information for teachers. This section gives you basic information about the topics covered in the unit. For some teachers, this material is merely a review. For others, the material will provide an introduction to new ideas. This section also includes a list of resource materials specific to the unit. Resource materials are identified by this icon. The guide then proceeds to the video-based lesson. 
Within this section, you'll find teacher materials clearly marked with this icon. The teacher materials summarize the content of the student video, describe the unit's goals and objectives, outline the class time required to do the activities, and identify any special preparation or materials required. You'll also find a list of vocabulary words to be reviewed prior to the lesson and suggestions for evaluating your student's understanding of the unit's key concepts. The lesson plan icons indicate pages where you'll find detailed steps for conducting the class, for organizing the activities, and leading classroom discussions. Student materials for the unit are also clearly marked. These pages are designed to be photocopied and distributed to the class. They include questions and activities designed to spark classroom discussion. The extension lesson offers a chance to explore a unit's content in greater depth. You'll find this section is organized the same as the video-based lesson with teacher materials, lesson plan, and student materials. The extension lesson also offers optional activities indicated by this icon. These activities can be used to supplement or to replace activities in the video-based or extension lessons. Now, in the back of the book, you'll find an appendix with a glossary of computer terms used in the guide, as well as information for how to reorder chip kit components. Now, each unit in the kit is introduced by a short student video segment, a video designed for use in the classroom. These segments introduce key concepts in clear and exciting ways. The video features a young host and two field reporters who take students to a range of different sites, from a chip fabrication facility and a hydroelectric dam, to a dairy farm, a student-run online business, and to a networked high school. At each location, they demonstrate how technology works and how it's changing our lives. Every segment is designed to spark student interest and to motivate them to take part in classroom activities. Now, the next part of the kit is the chip kit. Open it and the first thing you'll see is a large disc enclosed in plastic. This is a silicon wafer. Look closely and you'll see hundreds of small rectangles etched into its surface. Each one of these is a computer chip. The wafer is used in units four and five. That's when students look at how microprocessors work and how they are created. Now, when you remove the foam pad, you'll see 9-volt batteries and C batteries, as well as switches, transistors, light-emitting diodes, or LEDs, battery connectors, light bulbs, a coil of connecting wire, and a roll of tape. All of these materials are used in the hands-on activities in Unit 2. That's when students explore circuits, switches, and transistors. This is the microprocessor. Use it for display only. It's non-functional and could actually damage your computer if you try to install it. The microprocessor is actually under this protective covering in the center of the chip. The rest is a ceramic plate that protects the chip and helps keep it from overheating. The gold prongs along the edge connect the chip to the computer's wiring. Under the microprocessor, you'll find a small plastic bag with additional chips. These chips are much smaller because they don't have the protective backing or connections. Again, they will not work in your computer. They're only meant to help students realize just how small these powerful devices are. Now that we've looked at what's in the kit, let's explore some different ideas for teaching each of the units. Each of the units in the kit stands on its own. You can do one unit or any grouping of units depending upon how much time you have and what you'd like to accomplish. If you only have three class periods, for example, you may want to do units one, four, and seven. Your students will learn the basics of computers, explore the workings of microprocessors, and discuss the impact technology has on the world. From these three units, you can craft a sequence that matches the interests of your students. If your students are more interested in electrical circuits and transistors, they'll enjoy the hands-on activities in Unit 2 as they build circuits, test conductivity, and learn about different kinds of switches. 
you may want to include Unit 3, which explores how the microprocessor uses zeros and ones to produce everything from video games to online graphics. Another possibility would be Unit 8, which focuses on the future and how technology might change our lives. Most of the activities require a minimum of preparation. Required materials are included in the education kit or you'll find them readily available from outside sources. Simply queue up the video to the right lesson and you're ready to go. Now let's take a look at each unit. Unit 1 provides an introduction to the four basic parts of the computer, looks at how the computer has evolved, and then compares the computer's brain with a human brain. Okay, Dr. Irene, we're at Unit 1. Why don't you give teachers some suggestions for leading their students through this unit? Ricky, in addition to the student video and the teacher's guide, this particular book really helped me. This book does a really nice job of helping you understand the connection between changes in society and innovations and changes in our technology. For your students, you want to gather up some pieces from wherever and whenever. Motherboard, floppy disk drive, hard drive, and I've managed to gather up a collection of floppy disks. Kind of like a stroll through computer technology. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a floppy, but is this still a floppy? All these are floppy disks, Ricky. Pretty obvious here. Mm -hmm. This one is hard to find. You may not get it. But you're going to find certainly some of these still in your schools. And we are most familiar with these floppy disks. Mm -hmm. And this is the latest one, and it will hold 100 megabytes of data. Mm -hmm. And of course, students are saying to me, well, why is it a floppy disk? These ones, which are the familiar ones you're going to see, don't feel very floppy, but if you'll remove this metal slider part and take it apart, mm -hmm. just put a screwdriver into the plastic and give it a twist. Once you've got it open, the floppy disk can come out and students can see that it is very floppy. Mm -hmm. Students then are going to say to you, well, if that's floppy, what makes a hard drive a hard drive? Mm -hmm. That's a very hard platter. And then this is made out of? aluminum or sometimes glass. Okay. A motherboard. The motherboard contains all the circuitry that allows us to do what goes on inside the computer. This is the microprocessor. Mm -hmm. You'll find other chips on here as well. Any of these black ceramic components that you're seeing have a chip underneath. There's an expansion slot for adding a card, a daughter card. I can put memory into here. Students really love to touch and look at the motherboard and see what actually is there. It really looks like a city. It does look like a city. It's very, very complex. And so the kids should really get a hands-on experience with this. Let students touch, feel. It really does help them learn. Transistors are the switches that give computers their power. Unit 2 provides a lesson in circuit switches and transistors. Okay, Dr. Irene, this looks like it would be a real fun, hands-on unit. Give us some ideas for how teachers should walk their students through this unit. This unit really is hands-on, and it's really fun. If you're new to hands-on, though, it can be a little scary. First of all, you want to make sure that you read all the pages that are in the teacher's guide. The suggestions are there. The step-by-step -step is there. So just take your time to go through it. Secondly, make sure you've done each circuit activity yourself. You'll know what's supposed to happen. While you're doing that, if you can find some students to work with you, just a small group, five or six maybe, then take them through all the activities with you. Now you've got student leaders to help you and to bring the whole class in. That's really important. And one other thing, don't underestimate students. Make sure that they dismantle everything at every station so that as the next group comes in, they have to start at the beginning. Now, they're going to be working with circuits where they actually can see components because so much of what's inside the computer is so small that they're not visible. So I've gathered up another collection of toys for you. What are all of these things? Well, the circuitry that works inside your computer is very, very small. It's hard to see the pieces, so you'd probably want to isolate some. We have resistors, capacitors, 
diodes. This LED is a diode that they'll find in their kit. Transistors and vacuum tubes. Now, as you can see from my collection, it just comes from all over the place. I've taken them from old pieces and people have donated them. If you don't have those things, the real simple way is to go down to the electrical shop and purchase them because they come in nice labeled packages and you know what each one is. The one thing I didn't mention was the alligator clips. We didn't put them into the kit, but the alligator clips will help students to do the connections. If you can find somebody to actually solder the wire onto the clip, that's really the best. All right. But even if you can't, they do help students to actually hold the connections tight. So don't let hands-on activities scare you off. You already know that your students can handle it. So don't be intimidated. Just introduce them and let them have fun with it. What can you do with a bunch of ones and zeros? A lot. Digital information is introduced in Unit 3 as we show students how zeros and ones can be used to create anything from letters and numbers to pictures and graphics. Okay, we're on the unit on binary numbers, digital information. Right. Digital information is what we call the information used by our computers. They translate everything into binary format, zeros and ones. Now, our students are not used to working with numbers that are represented as zeros and ones. So the binary counter will help them with that. When they use the binary counter, they're learning to see the binary representation of their ordinary counting numbers. So you and I think of five, and in the binary counter, that's going to be represented as one, zero, one. Now, in the directions, it does tell you step by step what you need, but I have to emphasize that you give enough time for that activity. The kinesthetic learner is going to learn that when they're part of the counter and they're working, but the visual learner gets lost in there. The visual learner has to step back and see the binary counter working. So give yourself enough time to actually swap your students and have them work both parts of the counter. Large groups of about 10 students then. In addition to that, the computer makes decisions based on its binary information. Okay, now you have some beads in front of us. What are we going to do with these? Well, I'm going to use these beads to help you understand how a computer makes decisions. Good. There's two special okay. words. The computer uses the word and, and it also uses the word or. So let's go with and first. I want all the beads that are red and faceted. So, red and faceted. Mm -hmm. So I've made a decision based on those conditions. So I only get just the one pile of beads. Okay. All right, Ricky, it's your turn. My turn? Oh, good, I can make decisions. Okay. All right, you're going to select the ones that are white and three-legged. We know that these are white, but these are white and three-legged. You're a very good computer, Ricky. Make a decision. The second word and decision that the computer uses a lot is or. If I select all the beads that are white or three-legged, white or three-legged, I end up with all of those. Mm -hmm. So this is or. Okay. Your turn, Ricky. You're going to do white or barrel-shaped. Simple. These are white. These are the barrel shape. Very good. Not as fast as computer, but good decision-making process. Not quite as fast, but just as accurate. So the two words, and, or, the computer uses to make its decisions, and it works with the binary information as it does that. All right, so the unit is going to help them to understand what digital information is, and they'll also come away with being able to understand that the computer makes decisions based on that binary information. That would be fun for kids to do. Hmm. Unit 4 introduces students to the microprocessor's basic functions, fetch, decode, and execute. We introduce each function and the role that it plays in processing data. 
I mean, the unit on microprocessors might seem difficult or challenging, but it's actually simple. How are you going to get teachers started? Right. Teachers and students have to understand that the microprocessor does three things. Fetches, decodes, and executes. And it does those three things over and over again very, very fast. So if you keep it in that context, it is fairly simple. Now, to help students understand that, we've included some activities on having them write instructions for a walking robot. The fun part is that you and I think, and sometimes students actually think, but if they're playing the role of the walking robot, they're not allowed to think. To help them with that, blindfold them. If you and I see an obstacle in front of us, we're probably going to stop. If I can't see it and somebody gives me the wrong direction, I should just run into it. That's what we want in the walking robot. They're fetching, decoding, and executing, but they're not thinking. Now, in the chip kit, you'll find that you have a packaged microprocessor. Won't look like this one. In the center, the chip would actually be covered. Here, you can see the chip sitting on the connecting lines that come out to each of those pins. Mm -hmm. That provides a way for the chip to communicate with the rest of the computer. The Scientific American issue from June 97 has a great picture that would help you. If you don't happen to have that magazine, their website really has everything out there that you could do. Just go in and have a search. You'll be able to download that same photograph. Speaking of websites, if you're interested in seeing a simulation of the microprocessor handling data and moving it around to various places on the surface of the chip, go to Intel's website. The address on that is www.intel.com, and the simulation is called How the Microprocessor Works, and you can trace the action of the 1 plus 2 or whatever it is going through the microprocessor. So it's fun and it's fun to watch, but it's a little complex, particularly mm -hmm. for your younger students. Mm -hmm. So when you think in terms of microprocessors, don't make it into a great big complicated thing. Fetches instructions, decodes or makes them understood, and executes or carries them out. That makes it pretty simple. Mm -hmm. In Unit 5, we explore the complex but creative world of designing and making microprocessors. We visit with engineers who talk about how chips are designed and how they're made. Then we take students inside a fabrication facility to see the amazing clean rooms where chips are actually manufactured. Now, Unit 5 focuses on the creation of microchips. Right, and that's a complicated procedure. There's two distinct steps to look at. First, I have to design the chip. Once I've got it designed, I actually have to fabricate it or make it. In terms of designing, it's very complex. I'm putting millions of transistors, many, many circuits, onto a very small area. So I have to do it very carefully. It will help your students to think in terms of the designers facing the same kinds of decisions as city planners. So we have to make decisions like, where do I place the school relative to the other things that I have in my city? Do I want it beside the city park? Mm -hmm. Maybe it should be close to the hospital. If I put it there, where do I put the police station? And where do the one-way streets go? All those decisions are involved in planning a city that works well. Once I've got the design made, I still have to actually fabricate that chip. So the steps that are involved in fabrication are equally complex and, and mostly automated. You'll find in the chip kit that you have some transparencies. The four transparencies will help you with the fabrication part of the chip creating. The four layers that are there do not necessarily hook together. We've just kind of pulled them at random. But each transparency represents one step in the layering process as we fabricate the circuits. Mm -hmm. The four transparencies that are there show you bits and pieces of circuitry. That's not going to help your students. So you story tell with them. You take the first one and say, your microprocessor has to talk to the printer, so here's circuits to do that. Put the second overlay on top, say, the microprocessor has to show you what you're doing, so you need it to go to the monitor. So the second set, which gives you an interaction between microprocessor and monitor, and so on. Work with something that they know, so they have a way to relate to it. So, creating a chip really isn't very complex. 
I just have to design it and then fabricate. The evolution of networks has transformed the computer from a calculating machine to a communications machine. Students learn network basics and then visit a high school where the network is changing the way students learn. This is our subject in Unit 6. Here we are in Unit 6. Irene, let's talk about networking. Right. Networking is not new to students. It's no big surprise. If they've sent a document from their computer to the printer, they're using a very simple network. Now, networks today are much more complex than that, and I'm able to send messages from my computer anywhere in the world, practically. Now, networks have some very special features to them, and generally, we don't look at it. So this unit tries to show students what's going on underneath the process of sending messages from one machine to another. An analogy would help. If I was to send a message from my computer to your computer, it would get chopped up in tiny little pieces, and each piece gets sent. And they may not go in the same direction or by the same nets, but when your computer receives it, it puts the pieces all back together so that you get the same message that I actually sent. That's called packet switching. The analogy that would help students understand that is, if you were moving from the west coast to the east coast, you'd have to package up all your household goods. Now, you've probably got some very special breakable things that you would want to handle and use in your own car, so you'd pack them. You'd send some things by moving van. You might put some things onto a rail car. So all of your goods are heading to the East Coast by various means. Mm -hmm. You arrive at the new home. You gather up all the pieces that have arrived from these various ways and put your household back together. Lo and behold, it feels familiar. It looks like what you're used to. So that's packet switching. It's all put into little bits and pieces and reassembled at the other end. Okay, now I think I know a little bit about packet switching, but what does this fishing line have to do with computer networking? Ricky, that's not really fishing line. That's an optical fiber. Many fibers like that go together to make up the fiber optic cable that's used in most of today's network. It's a very high-speed cable. We don't have samples like that in the kit. And you really need to find some. So teachers could locate some by maybe checking with the person that put their network into place. They could contact some of the dealers that sell that cable. And they can get short samples. Students love to just touch and feel, as you know, so they can have a look at what makes up the networks they're using. And would that cable be just this small? Well, no. It takes many of those fibers together to make a cable. Fascinating. Technologies which become widely used have the power to transform society. From Henry Ford's mass-produced automobiles to the omnipresent telephone, they've all changed the world and in surprising ways. Today, the microprocessor has sparked a similar revolution, and only time will tell the full extent of its impact. Irene, with the vast variety of technology today and all the changes that are taking place and so quickly, how do you bring that all into the classroom? Ricky, it isn't easy, and teachers just aren't going to learn everything that's out there to learn. But you make a start, and you just do as much as you can, and you have fun while you're doing it. We can't keep up with everything, and teachers are going to have to decide, out of all of that, which am I going to master and which am I going to share? One of the difficulties for me as I began this unit was trying to get a feel of the interaction between technology and society. So I again would recommend this particular book. The Infoculture book really helped me to understand the impact and influence of one on the other. So teachers can start with that and it will help them to get set up. The technology is very pervasive and we see it in every part of our society and every part of the things we do each day. Your students are going to have fun in this unit. This particular book would be helpful to you, the teacher, because they have an activity that's going to have them simulating some movie making. How did they do it? How did they do it? They're going to do some wireframing, some animation, and some rendering. So for teachers, there's a reference out there. Some of your students might not be interested in that. There are other places to send them. Technology is changing the way the professional athlete trains, or even the amateur athlete. So they might want to investigate that. 
if you have students in the classroom that are interested in perhaps medicine as a profession. There's tremendous changes in the medical field as a result of our new technology. In this unit, it's kind of fun because you're playing an interaction of you do this because you can. You might throw in some old things. Do you have a wind-up alarm clock? Many students today have never seen one. Bring it in and contrast that with the digital alarm clocks that they're familiar with and are using. So make it fun. What's the interaction? Technology is so pervasive. Everything that they do in their day in some way is being influenced yeah. by that technology. Mm -hmm. It's always difficult to predict the future, but in this unit, we'll look into the future to see how computer technology might be changing our lives. We'll look at some exciting uses for new technology, and we'll talk to some kids about what they think the future holds. Irene, short of having a crystal ball, how do we talk to teachers and thereby students about what the future will be like in computer technology? Well, Ricky, a crystal ball might be fun, but for myself, I like to speculate. I don't want anybody to really tell me this is what's going to happen. I like to play what if, and many students would feel the same way. But you're correct. Technology is changing rapidly, and we're getting all kinds of information on where it might be heading. Just in the short time where we were working on this particular teacher's guide and putting the material in place, we had to do some changing two activities in here. One is unproven predictions and the other one is proven predictions. And I had to move two of the unproven ones out of that section and into proven predictions. So it's changing very, very rapidly indeed. The future, how do you talk about it and where do you find resources? The future is discussed in many, many areas. Check your newspaper. Look at some of the articles in places like Scientific American, Popular Science, Discover Magazine, Business Week, Time Magazine, all of those are always carrying the latest, greatest suggestions and where technology might just be taking us. This particular book, On the Cutting Edge of Technology, also is a great place to start. So you might want that reference in the classroom if you can find it. In terms of what the future holds, students are really incredible and creative. Let them try and tell you where technology is going. Challenge them to actually write down there what if we can do this and what it's going to look like down the road. Have them illustrate it with some graphics. I'm looking towards a future that I can decide that breakfast will be delivered in bed by the local robot and then it cleans the house while I'm outside playing. Good thought, good thought, <laughs> yes. We don't know where the future is heading, yeah. but I'm excited to be part of that. Your students are the future. Let's see where they take us. The journey inside the computer is designed to work at many different levels. Use it at a level where you're comfortable, whether that's just an introductory class or an extended look at specific topics. The important thing is that you use it. By increasing your students' understanding of microprocessors, you'll help them become knowledgeable users of technology and citizens better prepared for the 21st century.